reflecting on the here and now, it's like remembering. Here and now, Pachubana Dhamma. The way it is, uh, this is continuous reminder, make this kind of a, deter, may, uh, make a determination to keep using this to be the Bhutto, the observer, the knower of Dhamma, not the person that, uh, the personality uh, that uh, thinks about, has values, principles, loves, hates, preferences, likes and dislikes. Because in uh, on that level, we all want to be happy and we don't want to be unhappy. We want to be respected. We don't want to be disrespected. We fear, you know, humiliation or blame. Societies, they're all about learning, you know, learning to live with each other in a way that uh, and we become very threatened by anything that is alien or different. So conformity and uh, out of fear and uh, because usually eccentrics, nonconformist people that don't fit into what is considered normal are, you know, excommunicated or humiliated or rejected from society. The ego doesn't want to be rejected. We fear humiliation, being excommunicated. <coughs> but Pachubana Dhamma here and now is, you know, being aware of our social conditioning, our fears, the sense of ourself. Uh, Whatever it might be, sometimes we might feel very proud, very good about ourselves, but we can also feel the opposite. So much of our life is seeing ourselves through <coughs> criticism or what's wrong or abnormal or different. So in the holy life, you know, the holy life, what is it? What is this really holy, this life we're living here at Amravati? Is this really the holy life? This is a Christ Christian term. Holy is uh, associated with Christianity, but what does it actually mean? Something that's holy, even in a Christian context. I remember the little church in uh, Chithurst, the little hamlet Chithurst, you know, going in there, meditating in that tiny little chapel and, and on the uh, window, stained glass window over the altar, is the word holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth is full of thy glory. And then you know, this is uh, brought up as a, Anglican, so I would, uh, you know, this is very familiar because they used to sing this all the time in uh, Sundays. But I did, you know, being a contemplator, I could just could dismiss it as Christian hymns uh, or contemplate what does holy, holy, holy mean? Lord God of hosts. Uh, and things like this, these words that when you're a child you just chant or sing according to, uh, you know, you just, you don't even know what they mean, but you kind of get some idea it means something very good, precious. Then in uh, Buddhist practice, you know, you, so you you're contemplating, you're reflecting, you're using, you know, these words that can be just things that you 
sing on Sunday in a ch Christian church that you don't really know what it means, you have some vague idea. Sacredness, holiness, purity, Lord God of hosts. And then you're, you know, you're, but then you're internalizing now with the Vipassana meditation, you're, you're looking inward, Yoni Somanasi, getting to the root of things. So language then is not to be just perfunctory, a, a habitual use of, of your language or English language. Just dismissing that is just Christian hymn singing. Or what does holy really mean at this moment here and now? Is it, do you have to be a Christian to be holy? Well, some people might have that view, but that's a view and opinion. But <clears throat> so my insights were this mindfulness, here and now. This is, this is blessed, this is holy, this is the Lord God of hosts. This is the when we talk about the Lord, the leader, the foremost, what is that in terms of this very moment that you, that, that you know, within you, not some imagined external Lord out in the sky. So this is like internalizing these, these words so that you, if everything, if there's only the here and now, there's only Pachubanatama, that's all there ever is, this is the real. Then we need to look always in the present, you know. And these words, what are they pointing to? Do we just dismiss them or is it nonsense? Hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, Christian words? We, we can't use Christian words because we're Buddhists. So then in, in, in my own insight into this was this, this, is, this is the entrance, the gate to the deathless. This is holy. This moment here and now, awake, fully conscious, alert, awake. And it's not mine, I can't claim that I'm holy person. You know, it's not, when I start thinking I'm holy, <laughs> that's Sakya Ditti again. <clears throat> now this is, this is uh, an encouragement to, to get to the root, you know, and to, you know, use, get to, you know, the language that we have, you know, if you're whatever your first language is, or using, you know, in a country like this, English is the lingua franca. <clears throat> so because it, it can be just a habit, we're so, it's habitual speaking of English, you, start, you know, the language you learn when, when you're a child, growing up, and so it can be just a, a, another habit. Blah, blah, blah in English chit-chat, gossip, and reactions. You know, like gossip, you listen, you know, I remember listening to my mother on the telephone when I was a child. And she, some woman would be on the other end telling her gossip. And inevitably she'd go into this, you don't say. Don't say. <laughs> and this kind of suspended. Oh. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> and that kind of, this is, you're telling somebody is doing something they shouldn't, and then you get this uh, shock. It's terrible. <laughs> you don't say. <clears throat> Mm 
So like Puto, Puto is uh, is the is the Buddhist word, the Pali word. And using that, so it is uh, uh, helpful to you to to remember here and now. Not about believing in Buddha, but using the word, powerful word, because it means awakened one, awake, conscious, alert, attentive, knowing. And then the Buddha knows Dhamma. And then Dhamma is, you know, the, we chanted last evening the funeral chants, Kusla Dhamma, Kusla Dhamma, Pyaka, Kata, Tama. So it goes through the whole list of, of, you know, skillful, unskillful, neutral. But it's, you know, these are, these, these are, are ways of contemplating Dhamma, is the skillful Dhamma, unskillful, neutral, happy, unhappy, and so forth. So the condition, we're seeing the conditions in terms of Dhamma rather than in terms of Val societal values or personal qualities. <clears throat> so the Buddha knows the Dhamma, knows the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. It's a knowing. That is through sati sampachanya, mindfulness, pachubana dhamma, here and now. When we think of Lord God of Hosts, what does that mean? Is that some kind of Christian superlative or man what at this moment that which is the ultimate leader at this moment in consciousness within you, that which is the ultimate leader So then this is to me, this is what Bhutto is, the Buddha. So the word Lord, uh, English word Lord, is the leader or the foremost. And so in this very moment here and now, then the foremost, that which is, is that point you cannot get beyond, that island, where you can't get, you know, with your personality, you can always get behind your personality. You can always see your feelings and observe your emotions and the sense of yourself as an as a individual, as a person. But that which you can't go beyond, get behind, is this, Bhutto, awareness, here and now, awakened consciousness, awakened consciousness, and where there's a knowing, it's a knowing from this point, you know, the, the humble position of this form, you know, because we're humbled by our own limitation, human body. Though the human body is definitely a limitation, as you very well know. <clears throat> so we're, we're limited to this form of our human, human body at this moment. So it's sitting like this, breathing like this. So you're, you're observing just the simple, or, the simple, the simplicity, the ordinariness of this moment. Not trying to imagine something holy and, you know, up in the sky or throughout the universe, uh, a force uh, that is, uh, that you kind of uh, create with uh, ideas or beliefs. 
but bringing attention here and now and recognizing it. This is it. This is the Dhamma. It's like this. This is real. Reality is like this. The point of intersection between the timeless and time, the gate to the deathless. So we're on that edge, aren't we? The razor's edge. Between the timeless and time. So it is a balancing act, you know, being able to, but first you have to recognize it. You can get the theory and, and think it all out and still, you know, be totally out of balance. Uh, because even though you understand the words, you know, like a tightrope walker. You know, like a tightrope artist could tell us how to balance yourself on a tightrope. But it, you have to actually get onto the tightrope and learn how to balance. <laughs> All the best descriptions, you know, uh, you know, it's a matter of learning the balance in a, in a, in a real way, here and now, not through uh, knowing all about how to do it from experts. So like meditation is, uh, is recognizing, balancing this on this razor's edge, this point of intersection between the timeless and time. So in the, in the Pali language, this Buddha Dhamma Sangha, like the Buddha knows Dhamma, the, the Buddha is not a person. Has no personality whatsoever. It's not a male or a female. It's not Asian or European. It's holy, isn't it? It's, it's pure because in that awareness, mindfulness here and now, it's completely pure. Consciousness is operating. It's not being distorted or stained through ignorance, greed, hatred, delusion, and so forth. It's this point of intersection where the time-bound conditions can be observed. All conditions are impermanent. <clears throat> and at the same time, while observing the condition, there's a knowing, a recognition of the unconditioned. So it's not a, you know, not kind of turning your back on the condition and, and uh, rejecting it, but knowing in terms of Buddha Dhamma, knowing the Dhamma, knowing the way it is. And so the, this, this kind of reflection brings us to, you know, to learn how to trust this ability we all have to reflect, to be awake and attentive in the present to the way it is. And that, of course, the unborn, uncreated, is the same for all of us. It has no separation, no gender, no race. It's completely pure. And then the condition, they're all impure. Every single condition is an impurity. They're changing, they arise and cease, they born, they're born, they die, they begin and end. Uh, they have there's good conditions and bad conditions. 
So purity isn't about being good. It's the natural, it's natural, it's Dhamma. It's holy. And then, then our entrance into holiness is through this awareness, gate to the deathless. So in this way, you can never become a pure person or, you know, this is, you know, your body is never going to <coughs> be anything other than what it is, you know, a collection of elements operating according to uh, laws, the law of karma being born, growing up, getting old, and dying. The personality, Sakaya Didi, that's a, all this uh, conditioning we, we've had from the day we're born. The identities, the, the attitudes, the principles, the values, the assumptions, the ideals, the manners, the etiquette of our particular ethnic inheritance. Some of it's good, some of it is neutral, some of it is uh, foolish. <clears throat> but our relationship to it is no longer, you know, you know, even uh, you know, thinking that we've got to keep the good stuff and throw away the bad. It's in awakened attention to conditioned phenomena from this point of intersection. So, that you know that whatever you're feeling at this moment, emotionally or physically, is like this. Whether it's good, bad, pleasant, painful, neutral, is not the issue anymore. It's not about you know, uh, compounding this with the, with the value judgment, a judgment of some sort, a, criti a criticism of some sort, evaluating it as right and wrong, good or bad. But in recognizing all conditions are impermanent. Sape sankarani cha sape tama anatta, all dhamma. There's no self. There's no permanent, separate self that's me and mine in Dhamma. <clears throat> so in my, my own practice, like, uh, my practice now is is uh, cultivating this balance point. Bhavana, in other words. <clears throat> But in order to cultivate this path, uh, we have to, we, we can't do it from Sakya Diti. We can't bhavana, we can't really cultivate until we, you know, see the path, know the path. The Samaditi Samasangapo, the, the fourth noble truth. <clears throat> and all the rest, before that, it's all sak still Sakya Ditti, in which can be very skillful. Developing good personal qualities is not to be despised or, you know, condemned. It's not, you know, to be a good person, be honest, keep the moral precepts, and so forth. But still, this is, you know, when we get into bhavana, then it is this, this is the 
state of, this is the ability we have to cultivate through awareness, which is through samaditi, samasangapo, which affects speech, samawaja, samagamanto, samachivo, right speech, right action, right livelihood, then samawayamo, samasati, samasamadhi. <clears throat> so one, one uh, friend of mine doesn't even like the word right understanding. He says right is is too, it's, you know, there's right and wrong in the, in the uh, sila, dana sila kind of level or social behavior or morality. But in, in bhavana, this is like samaditi from these insights into the noble truths is like perfect understanding. It's perfect, it's pure. It's, inside, it's from the insight, it's holy. It's absolutely true. And, and there's a knowing and a confidence. So this is jnana dasana, or the where insight knowledge. It's not just knowing about having a, a good intellect and figuring it out conceptually, but knowing through insight. Yanya Patipano. One who practices insightfully. The Pali word jnana. That's jnana is knowing it on a deeper level. It's not knowing about Pali language or, or about Buddhism. It's a Profound knowing, direct knowing. <clears throat> so that's that's uh, why I keep uh, torturing you with these reflections, <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because we do forget. And the problems, community problems, the personal problems that we all have here at this place get in the way of the path. You know, these can overtake us, overwhelm us, swarm like worms within our living clay. <laughs> because en the world is endlessly problematic. You know, every monastery I've ever lived in it has endless problems. Don't expect to find uh, any monastery on this planet where everything is with no problems. It just seems to be this is the this is the sansara that we have to learn from. It's like this. <clears throat> Living with Ajahn Chah in Wat Bapong, you might think, well, Ajahn Sumedho was able to live with a great teacher like Ajahn Chah in, in a perfect monastery. It wasn't perfect. There were always problems. <laughs> and some of them worse than anything we've ever had here. You know, scandals and so... Uh, things that were shocking, and how could that happen? But, but yet, one can idolize Wat Bapong from this point, you know, when you're in the throes of despair around uh, the problems we have here, and thinking that if you go somewhere else, there won't be any. But th th just to warn you that the sangsara is problematic. It's all about change and and uh, you know, it doesn't, things just don't change for the better. Conditions ne never get better and better, better and better, better and better, better and better, and better ad infinitum. <laughs> and yet we might wish that life could be like that. But this realm we're living in is like this. It, it reaches peaks where everything is perfect, you know, seems perfect wonderful and then it 
it reaches a peak and then it can only go the opposite direction. Like your inhale, inhale, inhaling can only reach a peak and then you have to exhale. So this is the, that knowing the breath, knowing the inhale, inhalation is like this. Knowing the exhalation is like this. Now that, just that simple reflection, and it, you know, it's rather boring, it's nothing fantastic, and it's obvious, but knowing arising, ceasing, inhaling, exhaling, that is from the puto position, knowing Dhamma, rather than me trying to develop Anapanasati. Can you see the difference? If when I try to develop Anapanasati uh, from Sakya Ditti, Sila Bhatta Bharamasa Witi Ketya, when I try to do that, sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail, get frustrated, get bored. And, uh, Sometimes I don't want to be bothered. You can come into the temple here, and think, Anapanasati, oh, what about this, what about that, what are we going to do with this, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> and the, the sangsara takes over. Then maybe out of Sakya Didi, I want to just stop that. I don't want to be worried about the future or have problems, communal problems, or have to make decisions or, or deal with conflict and, and so forth. I want peace. I want tranquility and peace. So I do Anapanasati out of Sakya Didi, out of my desire for peacefulness to shut out and suppress any kind of turmoil I might be experiencing emotionally. But there's a knowing of all this, uh, you know, this, this puto knows. So, you know, this is to encourage you to trust this, this awareness. Sati sampachanya, sati panya, as your refuge. Now the convention that we have, Dhamma Vinya, Vinya is the conventional, is the convention we use. And so it is convention. And it's a, a traditional convention. So it, it means it's, it, it traces its roots back to the Buddha. Or we assume that, that's our assumption. So, so that convention, form, it's a form, is a, is a vehicle for, for, uh, that has survived through time, through 2,552 years. <clears throat> Now, there are various views and opinions about Vinaya, you know, so you've got Vinaya experts, scholars, uh, people that have strong views about it, for and against it. I've heard all kinds of criticisms of it, and, uh, and also the, the, you know, the blind attachment to Vinaya, you know, kind of, it has to be like this, can't change it, or uh, you've got to d adapt it, change it to the values of modern society. Because it is a convention. But, uh, but it is also, if it were just a, my, my opinion against yours, if it was just what I think, and my interpretation of Vinya, 
uh, or my vinya that I create, then it's subject to change because, you know, it's, it's not, not a tradition anymore. It's, uh, I'm outside the tradition, I'm just forming my own cult, really, of Ajahn Sameto Vinaya, uh, and and then uh, that's subject to argument and to <clears throat> criticism and can be changed, can be negotiated on because it's it, it's not it's just me against you as two different people. But the, this trying to maintain this tradition, this Theravada tradition, as we've learned it through the Thai forest tradition, Lung Po Cha. <clears throat> so, this is, this is uh, the way we do it. This is the tradition, and this makes life much more simple. Once we, we uh, you know, this is, this is the agreement when we take the Bapa Cha and the Upasampada, we agree to live within the structure. It's no longer negotiable. Because it is this, this will, once this agreement is made, once we accept this, then we don't have to think about changing it or, or, or doing something else with it. The convention is like this, we're using it for awareness. Now the convention of India, its purpose is not for institutionalizing or, or you know, setting up conditions on a personal level. It's not about junior, senior positions as personal attributes. It is a structure, so any structure has to have, you know, you have to agree on the, you know, A comes before B, and B comes before C. Just to make it easy, so you learn A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But you, you know, if we don't learn it in a, in a structure, then it's, it's all over the place. So in a community, monastic community, the structure is the you know, is like this. Recognize the structure that you uh, that you're in, so that you can be mindful with it, not to see it in terms of personal privilege. So, being senior doesn't mean you 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 know you're in some advantage over somebody junior. We have, if you study the vinya, it's all about duties we have to each other. Upachayas to their sativiharikas, teachers to their students, seniors to their juniors, juniors to the seniors, and the student to the teacher, and so forth. So this is this is about duties. And we call it acharya vata, the different vatas, responsibilities that we have in the particular position we're in. Now, taking this personally, that's Sakya Ditti, and then it doesn't work. You don't feel frustrated, annoyed, or envious, or, or um, you know, unhappy because you're, you know, you feel you don't like a, the position you have in the structure. But that's the point of this uh, mindfulness, is to observe that, one's discontentment. One's resentment. One's rebelliousness against uh, the structure. This is all Dhamma. You know, you can't, it's, take ordination and then be completely uh, au fait about the Vinaya. You know, it takes a while to actually learn it, to, to study it, to get to know it in detail, and to reflect from it. <clears throat> so, and this is where this, uh, this 
reflection on Sakyaditi Silabhata Bharamasa Vichikecha. If we just take Vinaya as personal positioning, that's Sakyaditi. But if we use the Vinaya for awareness, like I'm senior to you, uh, and if I, you know, if that, that thought arises in my mind from Sakyaditi, I'm the Ajahn here and you're the student, I'm senior to you, and so you must respect me because I'm, I have 43 Vasas and I'm a disciple of Ajahn Chah, and you're just a neophyte just a junior monk. You're only a nun. And I'm somebody, and you're, you're just a novice. Now that is Sakya Deity, isn't it? That's, you know, these, these positions do trigger off these kind of supercilious attitudes. It's not that, that I've never had such thoughts in my mind, you know, on a personal level. But there's the knowing, you know, the practice of bhavana is seeing those thoughts, those reactions, the sakya ditti I can create about the position I'm in. Recognizing it's like this, <clears throat> feeling that I'm, you know, I'm superior to you is like this. You know, so I can actually see the dhamma of this. This, this feeling, this emotional need to, to have power or be in a position in, of authority is like this. And then I question, you know, is this a peaceful state of mind? Is this, does this lead to peace and coolness? By grasping my senior position, does this lead to Wisdom, Does it, is it the path? No. Feeling that I'm better than you is not a peaceful feeling when you really look at it. It is what it is. You know, the, any form of Sakya Ditti is not peaceful. It's, you know, self-importance, me and mine, when you really observe it from the Puto position, it's not, you know, it's, it's always fraught and, and triggers off all the, the tendencies of personal resentments and, and emotional habits that one has. <clears throat> and this is like mindfulness, is able to see, the, or the junior, the Samanera, the Thiladhara, Anagarikas. You know, and they say, I'm only an Anagarika, uh, is uh, Sakya Ditti. If, if, you know, if you really operate from that grasping without reflecting on it. It's a fair enough identity. And then, then you, you know, Somebody says, who's that? Says, well, she's only uh, a new Anagarika. She's only, you know, she doesn't know anything really. She's just, just a new Anagarika. And so you hear me saying that, then what do you feel? You know, you think, oh, I'm just dismissed. I'm not respected. You know, I'm not appreciated because I just, I heard him over, I overheard him saying, you know, She's only an Anagarika, only an Anagarika, you know, so that is like uh, me, I'm not, not anybody of importance. Now, these, ha you know, when we cling to these identities, then we are going to be hurt. Unless we're, you know, we have to be incredibly politically correct all the time. Never, we forget the only part. And... Uh, because that, that uh, it makes me feel disrespected if I'm only an Anagarika. But they say, she's a, 
and I think Gauri Kaur dedicated to the path, and we feel that that's what I like to hear. <clears throat> but whatever, whether you're being insulted or praised, is still Dhamma. You know, this is this is where you've got to have the the strength of and determination to use what's ever happening for whatever way you are to see Dhamma, to be on that point of intersection, to observe, you know, how hurt one can feel over such a statement of only. Or how, you know, how appreciated one feels and cared for and, and, and accepted when you're praised. <coughs> Praise and blame, isn't it? It's, it's insidious. I've had to work with this endlessly. Praise and blame. But it's like really using it, these eight worldly dhammas. Good fortune, misfortune, happiness, suffering, praise and blame, success and failure. <clears throat> because all of us experience these eight worldly dhammas at various times. It's just the sangsara, you know, the changing conditions, the unstable changingness, the relentlessness of sangsara's moving, changing whirlpool of conditionality. And the only way to not be caught in that vortex is through mindfulness. Then you're poised on the edge, the razor's edge, which sounds rather, razor's edge is really a strong <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> but it's, you're poised at this point of intersection. So see, mindfulness is a kind of poise, inner poise, and openness. It's not about being reborn again seeking a, a beautiful birth in, in, in a beautiful condition, but poised on the razor's edge, poised on the tightrope, learning to balance, to cultivate this, this inner poise. Within this uh, changing condition of the physical body, the, the, <coughs> the conditions that we're experiencing, which are changing according to other conditions. You know, try to stop them changing or to control uh, all the conditions is, you know, is, you, is impossible. None of us are capable of doing that. But we can do this. This is within uh, our ability. This is a, a perfection of our humanity. Just this alone. Now we're in a society that's very, you know, where ideals are very strong about rights and so forth. And, and self-view, standing up for yourself. And, uh, you know, these, these are very much the, um, a, the an atmosphere we live in, in this society. Claiming your rights, standing up for yourself, integrity, personal integrity, principles. I must die for my principles, stand up for my principles, and my integrity. And so notice that these words uh, can be forms of sakaya ditti. My principles can be, you know, people can have very high-minded principles, but do you know what you're doing with them? Is it creating a sense of your separateness and your purpose in life as a personality? 
you know. So we, uh, you know, come across this a lot. My principles. I'm a principled person with high standards. And when you really look at that, you know, when I, when I look at that in myself, it's not peaceful to be a person with high principles and high standards because then I'm, I'm always feeling threatened by the fact that the changing conditions don't allow the world around me, the society I live in, to operate according to my principles. So people that have high principles, you know, are admirable, but it's still a form of suffering because it, 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 it's a separative identity. It's still coming from a vicha sakya ditti level. Now, I'm not asking you to believe this. This is a reflection, but you're getting to the root of suffering. You know, what are the causes of suffering? Clinging to conditioned phenomena out of ignorance. And the, the only way out of suffering is then divulged very clearly by the Buddha, mindfulness. The Four Noble Truths is a, is a brilliant uh, tool to use, to see for yourself. It, my principles and my integrity, you know, may be very high-minded, but when I operate from that, you know, when I really look at, at me, Ajahn Sumedho, with my high standards and principles, that is not peaceful. It puts me in a position all the time of threat, of being threatened by the society that has, doesn't have my high principles, doesn't share my moral standards, doesn't, you know, is, is, is beneath me is corrupt, selfish. Or then, I myself, if I have very high standards that I can't live up to on a, in a personal way, being the perfect Buddhist monk, being always the compassionate bhikkhu at all times, being, you know, standing up for what is right at all times and, and being an inspired source for the society, being a role model for you all, you know, and these are the ideals that can be, you know, very, um, you know, that I can never really live up to on a personal level because my personality is not perfect. It's not, you know, it, goes, it can go up and it can go down, it can be happy, it can be miserable. Personality changes according to condition. Sometimes I'm very inspired by monastic life. I think this is wonderful and I just want to dedicate myself to this community and do the best I can to, to bring you all to the path. And sometimes the personality says, oh, I'm fed up with all this. The endless strife and quibbling and quarreling and pickiness and doubts. And it's fed up with it all. I want to go off to my cave. Go back to Thailand. That's the Sakya Deity, isn't it? So it can go from, I want to dedicate my life to... I want out of here, <clears throat> in a matter of seconds, actually. <laughs> Emotions uh, <laughs> change very quickly. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, but the knower of this, the knowing, this is, this is it, this is what I trust. The puto knowing the dhammo, the Buddha knowing the dhamma, the truth of the way it is. So on this retreat, at the end of the Vasa, see the, you know, like cultivating this, getting really, you know, 
be daring. Go and really look at what suffering is, the, su the suffering of being a personality, of me and mine. And, and is it really, you know, is it really worth dedicating your life for your principles in your self-importance or whatever? Or, you know, the, the uh, monastic life is about self-surrender. So self-surrender isn't about, I, I as a person must surrender. It's seeing the, the suffering that we create through attachment to self-views, to atta, to the sense of me as a person, to sakya ditti, to my cultural conditioning, to the thinking process itself to the ideals that are part of my cultural attitudes or religious attitudes, my principles, and all this, is not to dismiss or deny these, but to get to understand what we're doing, what the cause of, of suffering is, is through ignorance, we are always attaching blindly clinging to desire, gama dana, bhava dana, vipavadana. We can't help it when we're operating from sakya ditti. We just, you know, we can't help ourselves on that level. <clears throat> so, gama dana, sense desire, bhava dana, is ambition or aspiration, isn't it? Becoming, wanting to become enlightened, wanting to, to uh, be a saint, a good person, uh, uh, wanting to be a, a good meditator, attain and achieve nibbana and all the rest. It can be, you know, a very high-minded form of desire. It doesn't mean it's necessarily selfish, mean, nasty, if me, me, me type of desire. It can be, you know, couched in the highest, kind of aspirations and ideals that, that our language allows us to use. Or the desire to get rid of things, get rid of my hang-ups, my fears, get rid of my vanity, my selfish tendencies, get rid of my pride and conceit. Extirpate the kalesas. uproot them, tear them out, <laughs> and that can be sakyaditi. Or uh, it can be vipavadana, desire to get rid of, destroy. But the awareness, you see, the, the it, desire is not something to, to suppress or get rid of, but to understand, to know. So this Reflection on gama dana, bhava dana, vipavadana is like this. The sakya ditti, the, the self-importance, my feelings, my, my principles, my integrity, my life, my aspirations, is not to be judge but to be recognized an attachment to that those perceptions of me and mine does it lead to peace does it lead to contentment now the the holy life is about you know this whole being alms mendicant is about being content with uh, four requisites. That's asking a lot, isn't it? Contentment. But when you, you know, that's where these reflections on four requisites is, helps to, to observe our own discontentment. Don't do it just perfunctorily like Patisanga, yonis, and not, not really reflect on it. But 
this is something to, like they call it samana sanya or or things to remember as a samana as a mendicant to keep keep it you know not to see myself as a mendicant you know and and it becomes like a deity but this is this is the mendicant form that we're in it's a mendicant convention that we're in the the buddhist samana it's a it's about mendicancy about faith about trust in in how of just living on the edge of survival the basic requisites necessary for physical survival is something to wear a robe something to eat medicine for illness shelter for the night it's not asking a lot is it it's not it's not high standard it's as low as possible standard of uh, material materiality <clears throat> so then if and when we remind ourselves then this this uh, this sense of katanyu arises katanyu gatuweti gratitude and gratitude i found an overwhelming experience for me as many of you've heard me talk about after my sixth vasa before that i was practicing not from gratitude but from Sakya Diti, a lot. I'm going to get my jhanas, I'm going to get this, I've got to practice, I want my... I was never content in any monastery. I was always looking for a better place. I was at Wat Bapong, four pansas, but it was too big, too busy, too much work. Went off to Tam Thang Pet, two years. Perfect place, and then all kinds of things interfered. All kinds of obstructions came up, destroying what I wanted, got angry. And uh, after my fifth Vasa, I ran away from Ubor and spent the Vasa in, uh, in Chonburi with Ajahn Chah. I was going to seek the perfect place, found a perfect Hermitage on Got Sichang, the island of Sichang, off the coast in the in the Gulf of Thailand, off the coast of Siraja, Chonburi. So, I found a perfect setup, and then my foot became infected, had cellulitis, was terribly sick, was in the hospital for three weeks in a monk's ward, with my foot up in the air, being injected with antibiotics and then had to spend the, because there was no doctors or medical facilities on the island I had to give up that and spend the Vasa uh, at another monastery Wat Kauchalak and then went off to India and all that was still very much motivated by Sakya Diti you know the, me practicing my practice my Vinaya my dedication and then it was in India actually that I started reflecting on all the, the generosity of the Thai lay people that had supported me for those six, seven years and of Lung Po Cha having you know, given me the teachings, accepted me as disciple, allowed me to live there in the monastery, put up with my bullshit behavior. And, you know, when I started really reflecting on how, you know, all the, the generosity as an alms mendicant, as a foreigner in a propfrung in Thailand, you know, the kind of respect I received uh, and opportunities made available to me and a wonderful teacher like Ajahn Chah, my heart just kind of bloomed with joy. It was like a real sense of, you know, tear. It was like tears of joy, of gratitude. Now that was a real heart-opening moment for me. Before that, it was very much 
from my brain, me, my self-importance, my practice, me getting what I want, putting up with the tradition, you know, just to stay in Thailand, kind of going along with it <clears throat> because you had to and and doing it, you know, and then even identifying, being, thinking I'm such a good monk because I, I keep strict Vinaya. I became quite proud that I'm a very, you know, my Vinaya is very strict and I'm somehow better than monks who carry money, who don't keep good Vinaya. I'm a better monk. So there is a kind of sense of that monks who, from Wat Bapong, are better than monks who aren't. <laughs> and, uh, this is not, this does not bring joy to the heart to be, you know, to be the best. And, and this is where this awareness of just observing the result of feeling like that. It is not peaceful to be better or be the best from the Sakya Ditti level. It doesn't lead towards liberation. <clears throat> but then reflecting on the result, you know, of the four requisites, the kind of generosity, because even living in poor areas of Thailand where people are quite poor, they still give you the best that they have. Thai people are not stingy, even if they're poor. Well, I mean, that really opens your heart when you think of, you know, the generosity that people, you know, respect what I'm doing so much. They're willing to, you know, to provide the necessities or the requisites and, and more than enough. So this kind of reflection is, 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 a, is a, you know, brings joy into the summon of life. This life is is a beautiful life when seen from, from this level, from joy, from gratitude, from contentment. But if seen from Sakyaditi, then it can be arduous and difficult and, and, uh, and it just becomes another form of attachment that leads to suffering. So when you say you suffer in this life, you know, Don't blame the form, you know. It's, it's the suffering is about, you know, sakyaditi clinging to desire. It's about wanting something you don't have or not wanting things to be the way they are. And so this first noble truth is, is the key to the door. <clears throat> That's why it's a noble truth. If I'm suffering here, what am I clinging to? And then, then this is where I observe, you know, I want something I don't have, or I want this to be some other way. I want Amravati to be different than it is. I want the Sangha to be something it's not, or uh, I want to go to a place where I don't have uh, so so many people around. Or I want, uh, you know, I want to get something or I want to get rid of something. <clears throat> so that this is uh, the emphasis also on this kind of practice is to, to really, you know, really, this is the priority, this awareness. The mendicant life is not to be, not take it for granted, make it work for you. So you, you move toward contentment and gratitude rather than, uh, you know, discontentment, complaining, envying, and all the, the things that can operate in a, in, a mona in a monastery. You know, personal reactions to each other are inevitable. But it, see it in terms of Dhamma, of, you know, and see the, the result of attaching to your opinions, your views, your ambitions, your desires, your principles. Avicca 
and then desire and attachment to desire. It's very clear, isn't it? A vita is, is uh, this identity with the conditioned realm, me and my. Once we, we extirpate a vita, then there's vita, then there's cultivation, there's bhavana, samaditi samasangapo, onward. And this is uh, the path, the Eightfold Path, or the path of non-suffering. So, um, may this um, stimulate your interests in the developing the path.